I'm Richard Zeckhauser, and I'm the Frank Ramsey Professor of Political Economy here at the Kennedy School. I've been here since the school started in 1969. Well, I uh, grew up originally in Philadelphia. Um, I moved to New York. My parents were both lawyers. Uh, neither of them practiced while I was alive. Uh, but uh, we talked a lot about legal things while I was growing up. Um, I had the opportunity to teach a course at the law school for uh, a couple of decades, and that was uh, sort of fun, and I suspect made my parents happy. Uh, and I'd say the uh, Two of the most influential people on my life, um, I hardly knew because they died when I was fairly young, but were my two grandfathers, uh, both of whom were uh, very capable people, and I heard stories about them. Uh, my paternal grandfather was an inventor um, who, unfortunately, was had very little commercial success, uh, but did have uh, some actual success. He invented the collapsible curtain rod, which he made the mistake of uh, selling to Macy's for $500. And he invented a rudimentary version of the Rubik's Cube, uh, which was just discovered in my uncle's attic uh, a few years ago. Uh, and my maternal grandfather um, was a man who was, they were both immigrants to the United States, but he was quite successful financially. He started the children's dress industry here. And I hadn't heard anything about him in 20 years until a year and a half ago um, when Malcolm Gladwell wrote his book, The Outliers, and um, he spends 11 pages talking about Louis Borkenecht. So, um, you know, I got to hear stories about him again. And of course, it's very important to know that, you know, these people were in your background. Both of them were quite intellectual, even though they didn't speak English and they didn't go to college. Uh, but they read lots of books. And I believe that that has an influence on the next generation and the next generation. And I will tell stories about them to my grandchildren who are now alive. It was certainly expected that I would go to college, uh, though I would say that um, my parents may not have had the uh, highest aspirations for me. Uh, when I was admitted to college, I was admitted to Harvard and I was admitted to a couple of other institutions. And my mother said that I should go to one of the lesser institutions uh, because she thought that Harvard would be too much pressure. The first day was intimidating because everybody is sort of showing off. And the first day that I was here, um, the first student that I met had invented his own algebra. And I sort of vaguely knew what algebra was, but I certainly didn't invent my own. Um, and. Um, I sort of said, what am I doing here the, with this brilliant mathematician? And he actually, it's very hard to flunk out of Harvard, but he's actually one of the people who did manage to uh, flunk out of Harvard. And, uh, well, I don't think I'd ever heard of economics, and I uh, took an economics course from a wonderful woman named uh, Barbara Berman, who's now a professor named Barbara Berman Bergman, professor, I, I suspect, emeritus at the University of Maryland. And she was a uh, very irreverent and very inspirational teacher. And then my second economics course I took from a man named Thomas Schelling, who's one of the founders of the Kennedy School. And uh, he became my advisor as an undergraduate and as a graduate. And I still refer to him as my advisor. Um, and I see him whenever I can. He now lives in Washington. Um, and he's a very outstanding economist. He won the Nobel Prize. Um, and he thinks about a variety of problems in the way that I would like to be able to think about them. He's an expert on uh, nuclear weapons and their control. He's an expert on the environment, in particular climate change. He's an expert on uh, how individuals should control themselves, for example, stopping smoking. And he just seemed to be you know, a terrific person to have as an advisor. So I asked him to be my advisor, and he was. I think that he... Uh, preceded a wave within economics which uh, has now uh, you know, engulfed the entire field, and indeed much of uh, social sciences, where it's applied to a very broad variety of problems. Um, because basically things like 
incentives really matter in all sorts of areas, whether you're trying to stop smoking or stop pollution or getting people to buy your products. So uh, Schelling just has this mind that can range over a vast number of areas, and that's exactly what he did. He went where he thought the problems were important and where he thought his tools would be useful. Um, I believe that uh, many aspects of a uh, successful career are serendipitous, and mine certainly followed that course. Um, when I was a senior, I applied to two graduate schools. I applied to Harvard Law School, and I applied to Harvard Business School. And um, I was fortunately admitted to both, and I decided to enroll in the business school. Um, and I was expecting to you know, go wherever that led me. And that summer, um, with uh, Professor Schelling's help, I went to work in the Pentagon for a man named Alan Endhoven, uh, who was running the first uh, systems analysis office in the United States. He was uh, the head of the original whiz kids in the Pentagon under Secretary McNamara. And uh, the first day I went in to see Alan Endhoven, um, he said to me, uh, so uh, tell me about your thesis. I said, this is going to be a great job. And we discussed my thesis for 30 minutes. And then he said, do you know how to add, multiply, subtract, and divide? And I said, yes. He said, do you understand what marginal analysis is, which is something you learn about the third day of your economics course? I said, yes. He said, well, that's all you'll need to know. So then I went off and I worked at the Pentagon for the summer, um, and I enjoyed that immensely. It was a, you know, as creative a group of people as I've ever uh, been associated with. And the last day of my employment, um, Alan Antoven called me in and thanked me for my work and said, so what are you going to do? Um, I said, well, I'm enrolled in Harvard Business School. I'm going to show up there in September. He said, well, why don't you get an economics PhD? And I said, well, why should I do that? He said, well, um, you seem to like it and you seem to be good at it. So I sort of reflected on that. And I said, oh, that sounds like a reasonable idea. So um, I called Professor Schelling, who's a very non-directive person. Um, and I asked him, well, what do you think? He said, oh, yeah, I think that's what you should do. I said, well, why didn't you say that? And he said, well, you never asked. So then he said, <clears throat> um, I'll help you get admitted to an economics program. And um, I got admitted to uh, some economics programs. And um, I decided to enroll in at Harvard that, you know, a couple of weeks later. And that's the way my career progressed. At the end of my graduate study, um, I was, uh, had a fellowship which enabled me to go abroad for a semester. And I had just gotten married. Um, and I got a letter from the chairman of the economics department. And he said, would you like to be an assistant professor in the economics department. And I turned to my new bride who had moved from, you know, who uh, had lived in New York. I said, how would you like it if um, I became an assistant professor at Harvard? We live in Cambridge. And she said, well, that sounds like it would be fun. So, you know, most people plan their, you know, uh, first job a lot more effectively than I did. But I did that and then, um, a couple of years later, um, uh, Professor Schelling and Professor Rafa and Fred Mosteller, who was a great statistician, um, uh, all said to me, we're getting involved with a, this new program at the Kennedy School where they're going to be teaching uh, public policy. And you ought to um, you know, come work with us. And um, that sounded like a very exciting opportunity. Um, I will just tell you that uh, Howard Rafa is a brilliant game theorist and decision theorist and the, one of the fathers of both decision theory and negotiation analysis. Um, and I said, sure, that sounds like a good idea. And then a uh, very effective entrepreneur named Richard Neustadt, who I think was really the driving force in creating this whole enterprise, uh, came and spoke with me, and he sort of sealed the deal. Um, and so I went and I decided to go and teach um, 
at the Kennedy School. And, you know, I've been here ever since. It had no reputation. I mean, the Kennedy School was just created. President Kennedy had uh, been, uh, you know, killed a, a few years prior and was still a very inspirational figure to many people. Um, it was a very different time in the country. Uh, the nation was uh, still uh, much more favorable to uh, government and towards public solutions. We were um, moving uh, into the extreme discomfort of the Vietnam War and the clashes that asso were associated with that, which certainly played a profound role on uh, you know, the campuses of the country. Um, but it was extremely exciting to be associated with the new enterprise and with such an extraordinary array of individuals. Uh, Richard Neustadt uh, understood very well the way to get a program launched. He knew that if you could corral um, a set of terrific individuals and sort of say to the, them, you come work with me, then he would be able to get, these are all senior individuals, he'd be able to get junior individuals um, to come work with him as well. And I wasn't uh, privy to the beginnings when he talked to Tom Schelling and Howard Rafe and Fred Mosteller, <clears throat> but I know that, you know, he twisted their arms hard and he sort of said, you know, you guys will all be working together. And that first summer as we were preparing for uh, the first class, we would all um, hang out together and, you know, plan the curriculum. And this was just an extraordinary ex exciting experience. I mean, nobody had any idea of where we were going. We had uh, 21 or 22 students, um, you know, nothing like the Kennedy School of today. We didn't have our own space. We were uh, tucked into uh, a little bit of space in the, uh, you know, the building that housed the economics department and the government department. Um, but I knew, I sensed that we were at the start, start of something that would be really significant. And that's what actually happened. It proved to be something really significant. The department was called Systems Analysis. I subsequently worked also um, in uh, what was then called HEW, Health Education and Welfare, before the Education Department was developed. And I worked in the Systems Analysis office there. So I had seen it in the defense sector, and I had seen it in the um, you know, health education and welfare sector. Um, and basically, the Kennedy School started out principally oriented towards teaching policy analysis. And that was a new discipline that wasn't really well developed. And it was, you know, a privilege to be involved in the creation of this discipline and this field. Public administration had been sort of a backwater. Nothing much had happened in that field for a long period of time. And this movement, it didn't just get started at Harvard. It got started at a number of different schools um, around the country uh, somewhat simultaneously. Um, there were some very effective people elsewhere. I would say, um, you know, the godfather of the movement not at Harvard was a man named Joel Fleischman who was uh, working out of Duke University and he would sort of run around and tell every school you ought to start a program like this. And ultimately lots and lots of different schools did start programs, some at the undergraduate level, some at the uh, graduate level. But it was amazing to see the number of schools that did this um, more or less simultaneously. And some of these courses and some of these materials just didn't um, exist before. And I think the proof of the concept was the first group of students that we managed to recruit who were just in an incredibly you know, capable and talented crew. And I think some of the um, most unpleasant disagreements that I've seen at the Kennedy School in my career were over whom we should admit for you know, those first few classes because, you know, there's no way you could not turn down, that you could turn down my favorite student. And then, of course, there was no way that we could turn down your favorite student, but we only had enough money for, you know, 22 students or 25 students or 28 students, whatever it might be. Uh, the dean of the law school who went on to be the president of the university, uh, Derek Bach, was a major mover uh, behind the um, establishment of the Kennedy School. And he saw it as a way to make uh, the law school a much more exciting place, that you would come to the law school, you would get your law degree, you'd get a 
master in public policy degree. Um, the first was a three-year degree. The second was a two-year degree. And you get both of those degrees in four years. And he thought that this would um, infuse the law school with new intellectual content. And some of us went over and we taught a course um, at the law school, which was designed to impart some of our curriculum to people who didn't come and you know, take our course. And many law students wanted to um, you know, enroll in our program. So we were then, of course, geographically closer to the law school, so that made it you know, a little bit easier. But I think that we had as many law students out of a class of, uh, you know, as many Harvard law students out of a class of uh, 22 or 28 as we do today out of a class of 220 because it was just such, uh, you know, an exciting thing to do. And some of them have gone on to, um, you know, quite successful careers. Uh, one of the law students from our very first class uh, just ran for uh, the Senate. Unfortunately, he was defeated narrowly, but I think that he'll be running again. I, by the way, I've had lots of students who run for office. Um, I tell them, look, I support you. I don't ask you what your politics are. You're my student. I support you. It's too complicated to say, what's your views on abortion? What's your views on Afghanistan? You know, and see what it is. There have been many, uh, you know, uh, changes along the way. I mean, the curriculum of today was not like the curriculum of uh, 40 years ago. Um, I was a little bit surprised. Um, I assumed I had just gotten a PhD in economics. And um, I said to the powers that be, uh, so I assume that I'll be teaching economics. And they said, well, actually, that's not correct. You'll be teaching um, analytic methods. That's you know, operations research and modeling and decision analysis and game theory. Um, and I said, well, why is that? They said, well, we already have someone who's teaching economics. So you'll teach this course. You'll teach it with Howard Rafa. And um, I said, well, uh, there's one slight disadvantage, which is that I've never taken a course in operations research, decision analysis, game theory, et cetera. And they said, you'll learn. And uh, I went into the classroom and I taught with Howard Rafa. And uh, he's a brilliant pedagogue who's deeply interested in how uh, you know, people learn. Um, and I learned the material. And I also learned how Howard Rafa teaches. And it was just a terrific experience. We taught together for um, a few years. And uh, you know, I just sort of admired him. It was a little bit like playing you know, uh, doubles tennis and having you know, John McEnroe as your partner. And you just sort of sit there and you admire his shots. And you sort of say, I wish I had his shots. So I, I wish I could teach like Howard Rafa. But that's just not one of my skills. I know that Professor Schelling had prepared <coughs> some lectures talking about the trade-offs between um, various factors of production. And he was an expert in defense um, economics. So he talked about the trade-offs between missiles and bombers. And it was purely abstract, and he could have just as easily have been talking about the trade-offs between you know, uh, lathes and saws in a woodworking shop. And um, the students immediately said, you know, we don't want to talk about missiles and bombers. I mean, he wasn't talking about specific missiles. He wasn't talking about bombing the Soviet Union. He was just talking about that. So um, we had, you know, some, you know, mini revolts. We had some discussions uh, where the students said we want to do more of this or that. Um, I remember very vividly um, one student who um, was always at the center of any protest that we'd have. His name was Dennis Hayes. He had been the president of the Stanford student body. And he thought that one of his roles was to be a political organizer for our class. And he said, probably the third day of uh, class, well, we shouldn't be here. We should be out organizing in the streets. And um, I didn't agree with him. Um, and fortunately, neither did most of the students. And you know, he continued along for a while. Um, but in the spring was the first Earth Day. And Dennis, along with a couple of other uh, students, uh, somehow or other got in a position to lead the first Earth Day. So the next time I saw Dennis was when he was on television. And remember, this is the guy who said we should be organizing people in the streets. And he was now 
you know, heading up Earth Day, he said, I can remember walking in the woods with my uncle and hearing the sound of the cuckoo, which didn't sound to me like, you know, um, the streets of New York. But I sort of said, well, that's sort of interesting. And there have been, you know, dozens of other interesting students just like that um, along the way, many of whom have, you know, started out in one direction and moved in another direction. And it's sort of wonderful just to see the panorama going by. Um, we had a uh, very energetic new dean named Graham Allison, um, who uh, was also very entrepreneurial. <laughs> and he wanted the school to be larger. And he thought it was very important. Uh, from the very beginning, we knew that we had to have our own faculty. So we borrowed uh, Rafa and Schelling and Mosteller from other faculties. Um, it was important to have our own faculty. So our junior appointments were all made just within the Kennedy School. And then once you have your own faculty, which is a very different approach, for example, than the approach taken by the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. And if we're the Red Sox, they're the Yankees. They're the sort of the long-term rival school, uh, longer established condition, much more money. Um, but as the Red Sox are ahead of the Yankees this year, uh, the Kennedy School is ahead of the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, but anyhow, Graham said we have to build, we have to get a new building. And um, he was um, a uh, wonderful fundraiser. Some would say a shameless fundraiser. He went to all sorts of people who had virtually nothing to do or nothing to do with the Kennedy School or Harvard and said, um, you should be associated with this new venture. You've fortunately been very successful. Why don't you give us $10 million, $20 million, $30 million? <clears throat> and he managed to, by knocking on 1,000 doors, he managed to find you know, 15 or 20 people who were willing to give us large amounts of money. And when the, building got, the first building got built, <clears throat> then we had to occupy it. And it's almost, I think, the um, equivalent of there's something in economics called Say's Law, which supply creates its own demand. And this is you know, having this uh, spanking new building um, of our own, uh, which we weren't large enough to fill, well, then we had to um, fill it. And there were a couple of um, major steps along the way. At one point, we absorbed the city and regional planning program from that had been in the design school. Um, I think another major development is we started creating executive programs, which are now a significant component of our school. So the student body has basically expanded. The MPP student body has basically expanded tenfold, a little bit more than uh, tenfold between the early years and the current time. And the faculty has probably expanded roughly tenfold as well. So at least we're keeping the proportions. To some extent, I'm following in the um, path that were set by uh, professors Rafa and Schelling, uh, both of whom were very unconventional within their disciplines. Uh, Howard Rafa was uh, trained as an, as an applied mathematician, but he was then recruited to Harvard Business School. He introduced decision analysis into the business school curriculum. He then came and he was recruited to the economics department. And then he came to the Kennedy School. Tom Schelling, um, after he was at the economics department, he came here, but he never applied economics in a conventional manner. He applied it to all sorts of different problems, as did Howard Rafa. They were basically methodologists. And I think of myself as basically a methodologist. Otherwise, I have tools and models and concepts, and I go and apply them where I think that they're going to be most interesting. And um, every day is very exciting for me because you read about something new in the paper, and you try and understand it with the tools and models that you have available. And sometimes you have to see that you go out and you uh, create new tools. And that's what I try and get my students to do. I tell them, um, I teach a course called Analytic Frameworks for Policy. And I say, we're going to go over um, a number of different models and tools. But when you get out in the real world and are confronting a real problem, it's not going to fit neatly into one of the boxes that you've learned here. So I want you to think for yourself. And it doesn't have to be a formal mathematical model. It can be something that you write down in a piece of paper. And that will be 
you know, an extremely useful thing to do. So um, my second to last book, um, I'll just tell you about the origins of that because that's fur probably furthest from anything that I was prepared for. Um, but I was in Italy and um, we had a guide who was taking us around Florence and explaining art history to us and in particular how the churches managed to support themselves. And uh, he said what they did <clears throat> is they sold chapels along the side to prominent families <clears throat> and they sold them for um, much more than they cost and this is the way the families sort of explained that they were important within Florence, which was very important for them. And I said, well, that's interesting. That's sort of what I do. That's all associated with the economics of information. Um, indeed, um, we had a wonderful assistant professor, the first assistant professor that I hired, named Mike Spence, who taught at the Kennedy School. <clears throat> and he wrote his doctoral dissertation uh, with Professor Schelling and with uh, Kenneth Arrow and with me, Kenneth Arrow being a, an economist now at Stanford, um, on market signaling, which is basically um, why people um, acquire certain characteristics which may not be productive in themselves, but sort of announce that you're talented, of which um, <coughs> the, um, ex the example that got the most attention was actually college education, which is if you're going to get admitted into an elite college, um, that's going to tell everybody in the world that you're a talented person. And you might want to do that even if the college itself uh, provided no benefit in terms of uh, skills that you need. I sort of explained the theory of signaling to this art historian. <clears throat> and um, we went off and we wrote um, a couple of articles together. And we talked about it some more. And we ended up writing a book um, called The Patrons Pay Off Conspicuous Commissions in Renaissance Italy. And it was all about why people would, you know, uh, support um, art patronage, would serve as art patrons. And, you know, 30 percent of the book is economics and 70 percent of the book is art history. <clears throat> and it was incredibly fascinating to write. And it was just, you know, a chance meeting with um, this art historian in Florence. And that's what I enjoy doing. Um, and that's what I've sort of done over the course of my entire career. And that's why I'm so excited about meeting the students at the Kennedy School, because they come from you know, many different backgrounds and they have interests in <clears throat> lots of different problems and you sort of learn about their problems. Um, so it's, it's worked out well for me. After I taught with Howard Rafer for a while, I started teaching on my own. <clears throat> there had been a uh, woman who had been in my graduate class um, at Harvard, um, several years older than I was, named Edith Stokey. And Edith was just terrific, tremendous, just tremendously bright, organized, clear thinking, and a delightful person. And we were friends, and I recommended her to the Kennedy School. And there was considerable skepticism, since uh, Edith was much older than the people that we normally appointed, and she did not have the PhD, and she had no publications. But, um, you know, if you sort of badger people enough, they eventually give in. And so they asked Edith to come here. Um, and Edith taught here successfully for, um, you know, well over three decades. <clears throat> she was beloved by all. She recently retired. Um, and she and I wrote a book together called um, A Primer for Policy Analysis. Um, and that became sort of the book that helped define the field of policy analysis. And it was a terrific experience writing with Edith because um, she works much more in the uh, tradition of Howard Rafa. She's very disciplined. She you know, moves ahead in a linear schedule. She said, Richard, we have to do this and this and this. And I would sort of say, Edith, I have this wonderful idea that we should throw into chapter four. And she said, we already have too many ideas in chapter four. Save that for you know, something else. And my experience today is um, Edith, uh, as I said, she recently retired, and she said that I could go to uh, her office and, um, you know, pick out a book. And I went that, you know, one of the books that she's bequeathing to the Kennedy School. And I went there, and the book that I selected was Luce and Rafa, which was the first book that I ever saw written by Howard Rafa. 
So it sort of tied my whole career at the Kennedy School um, together. And um, I'm actually trying to uh, revise the book, uh, you know, Stokey and Zeckhauser, which I think has influenced, you know, uh, lots of individuals in many different locales over uh, many years. Indeed, you know, maybe uh, two or three times a year I run into somebody and they said, oh, I had to study your textbook, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I was in graduate school at the University of Michigan. And sometimes they say, I loved it. And sometimes they sort of say, you know, I really hate math. And if they really hate math, the, this book wasn't for them, uh, though we tried to be very clear. Well, the culture was, um, and I think it's still true in our Lit Tower building, which works uh, extremely well. The, I don't know who the architects were, but they did a very good job. There's a lot of running in and out of various people's offices, and sometimes, like, uh, this interview happens to be conducted on the day after uh, the Bruins won the Stanley Cup. So today I presume that I will talk to three of my colleagues about the Stanley Cup. Um, <clears throat> and I think that that's important. I think if you're going to talk to people about intellectual activities, it's important that you talk to them <clears throat> about, you know, just, you know, hobbies. Because we talk a little bit about our hobbies and I sort of say, well, tell me about your latest paper or tell me about what you're trying to cover in your course or tell me about where you're going to be going this summer and what research you're going to be uh, doing there. And when our school was small in this building, we had a faculty dining room and most of us went there most of the time. And it worked very well because you were always just talking to your colleagues and sometimes you're complaining about the dean and sometimes you're saying how great the Bruins are and sometimes you're uh, asking um, about an intellectual problem. So we were always engaged there. I mean, um, what was very important is that Tom Schelling, <coughs> who um, really made you know, the Kennedy School his base of operations, was there on a regular basis, and he's always a fascinating person uh, to talk to. And then it was interesting. It's the type of phenomenon that uh, Tom Schelling would discuss. <coughs> As the school got larger, um, things got a little bit less cohesive, and not enough people came to fill the dining room. So we could fill the dining room when there were uh, 40 of us, but we couldn't fill the dining room when there were 100 of us. Um, because with 40 of us, you wanted to go there, and that's sort of just you know, where you gathered on a regular uh, basis. So uh, my personal response to that is I, tr I have cut, uh, lunch with uh, uh, usually a junior colleague or a graduate student um, four days a week. And, you know, that's a time when you, you know, really get um, a lot of stimulation, frequently just advising them on their work. And that's a, you know, terrific opportunity for me to, you know, maybe help the next generation. Um, I know that the people who came before me were uh, tremendously influential in teaching me how to think about problems and even how to uh, Fred, well, uh, I think from uh, Tom Schelling, I just learned how to think about problems. From Howard Rafe, I learned he, um, also how to be uh, uh, an expositor. And Fred Mosteller did something which I've tried to do with people. <clears throat> I didn't know him nearly as well. He wasn't one of my advisors. But um, he called me up one day, and I wish I could imitate him better, but it's basically he talked sort of somewhat slowly. He'd say, Richard! I'm working on this project with a group of surgeons at the medical school, and we have to write a summary chapter where we draw all the lessons together. So I'd like you to join this surgery group and help me with that final chapter. And uh, my reaction was, wow, this is wonderful. I mean, uh, Fred Mossell has asked me to collaborate with him. And then I um, sort of asked myself, I don't know anything about surgery, and I don't even know much about what he was doing. Why did he ask me to do this? And I think the reason he asked me to do this was he thought that he could uh, teach me something. So I joined the surgery group, and the surgery group consisted of, <coughs> um, you know, uh, three statisticians, uh, an economist, namely me, and 20 surgeons. And we would meet on a regular basis, and we would discuss surgical procedures. And then I helped uh, Fred, 
you know, do some drafting. And I learned how he did it. And since he was, you know, a great scholar, um, I learned a lot from that experience. And he never said it to me, but I believe he was trying to, uh, you know, uh, make me a better scholar, and I think that he did. He also, by the way, gave me some advice on um, how to behave with my fellow uh, faculty members. Um, he sort of said, uh, one of the things is that you should always realize that when you're, he called me um, aside after a faculty meeting, and he said, um, can we have lunch sometime soon? And I said, sure. He took me to lunch, and he said, you know, when you disagree with someone, you shouldn't try and assess his motives. It was mostly he's, certainly in those days. You should just express your point of view, and that will be much more effective, and your colleagues will like you better. And um, I thought about that for a little while, and I've f tried to follow that advice, and I think it's uh, made me a more effective faculty member. Well, I think that um, you know research is really critical um, for our school because um, the public policy problems that come at you are always changing. I and mean, the problems that we confront in 2011 look nothing like the problems that we were confronted by uh, governments in um, you know, 1969 when the school started. I and mean, what are we going to do when we have you know, just a dramatic deficit and a very large debt? What are we going to do when uh, the country is so polarized politically? What are we going to do when we are confronted with terrorism, which um, you know, a little over a decade ago, people said terrorism is not a problem on American soil. Well, it's a problem in American soil and certainly a problem for America all over the world. And that, you know, just, you know, didn't exist. So I think that we have to keep doing research to understand um, the broad swath of new problems that keep coming along. There was some inkling of climate change as a problem, um, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, but now we recognize that it's much more of a problem today. Now, some of the same themes recur. The uh, first assignment, I worked for a few summers for an organization called the Rand Corporation. And uh, somebody, uh, my boss came into, which is out in Santa Monica, California, and works as a nonprofit that works for the government. And my boss came to me and said, we'd like you to explain to the NATO allies why they should contribute more to the common defense. And I went off and worked on this problem. I worked with a man named Mansur Olson, um, who um, was a great scholar, also a student of Professor Schelling. And we eventually wrote an article called An Economic Theory of Alliances. And the uh, lesson of that analysis, unfortunately for the United States, is that the big player is always going to pay a dif disproportionate share. So we've seen that now in uh, what's going on in places like, you know, Afghanistan, where we have, uh, you know, supposedly, uh, you know, a multinational force, but the overwhelming majority of that is being done by the United States. And I believe the same thing will happen when we get around to dealing with, um, you know, global warming. If there are going to have to be transfers between developed and developing countries, um, the major countries are going to have to pay, the larger countries are going to have to pay a disproportionate share. Indeed, uh, Secretary Gates, in his farewell address to NATO, said, um, this is Defense Secretary Gates, he said that if NATO is going to continue to survive, our allies are going to have to contribute a greater share of their GNP to the common defense. So this problem of nations with common endeavors having to uh, find ways to uh, cooperate, um, you know, is an enduring problem. It's just now it applies more to things like climate change and fighting terrorism than, you know, whereas uh, 40, uh, you know, uh, plus years ago it applied to containing the Soviet Union 
an entity that no longer exists. So um, I think the other thing that we need research for is we, uh, there are many just new ideas that appear within academia. Let me ex give an example of one that's been most influential uh, for me, which is the whole field of behavioral decision. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, um, some psychologists observed that human beings were actually quite poor decision makers, and they were poor in ways that we could readily identify. For example, they would um, anchor on their original estimates. If I originally thought that something would happen and I got some information that was contrary to that view, I tended to stick much too much with my original view. They're very poor at dealing with probabilities so that they don't distinguish much between a probability of 1%, 5%, or 10%. But if somebody tells you that you have a 10% chance of dying of a heart attack in the next decade, and we can cut that by a factor of 10 to 1%, we've done something really terrific. So this field of behavioral decision has now uh, moved out. It's now moved into the field of economics. Uh, economics is often criticized because it assumes everyone is a rational actor. And now large numbers of economists, um, including Richard Zeghauser, now sort of say, no, we don't assume that everybody's a rational actor. And sometimes we get very dramatic examples of where behavioral decision plays a prominent role. Um, I would say that the financial meltdown of 2008 and 2009 is a good example, where even the most sophisticated people in the United States uh, fell prey to um, behavioral decision, both within the government and within the financial sector. So um, it's very important that we understand what this is and we understand how it applies to public policy and we infuse it into our curriculum if um, our students are going to understand the world and they're going to be able to confront the world. Um, my most recent book, uh, which is called uh, Collaborative Governance, Private Roles for Public Goals in Turbulent Times, um, which was uh, published in April of 2011. Um, I wrote this book with Jack Donahue, who teaches here and is now chair of our um, uh, public policy program. And the basic theme of our book is that uh, government has increasingly called on the private sector to accomplish a variety of its tasks. So this is true with regard to, um, say, uh, the delivery of welfare services, which are overwhelmingly delivered by uh, private sector organizations, both for-profit and non-profit. Um, it's true with the recently we had our uh, penultimate space shuttle mission. Um, all the ground, all the work that was done on the ground for that was done by a private sector organization called the United Space Alliance, which most people have never heard of. Um, the example that opens our book is Central Park in New York, which uh, when I was living around New York was basically after 6 p.m. was a no man's land. It was a place where you would go to meet your mugger. Um, it was uh, littered. Um, it was, in many places, decrepit. And now it's beautiful. It's safe at night. There are uh, hundreds of people out there at night having a good time. And it's all because um, the city's park department decided to work with an organization called the Central Park Conservancy, um, which devotes thousands of hours and millions of dollars each year to making Central Park a wonderful place. Well, my view is that given that government is so constrained, and particularly since it has a very hard time attracting terrific talent at the top given our unfortunate salary structures, uh, we're going to have to continue to call on the private sector to deliver lots of public services. And the structure, this is happening in lots of different places, but we argue in the book that because nobody has studied it as a unified concept, um, it's quite poorly understood. And we think that our students for um, the next decades, as opposed to the past decades, are going to be much more <coughs> in the business of contracting with private sector organizations to accomplish their work. And, and the essence of collaborative governments, the central concept of collaborative governance, is that there's a sharing of discretion between the public and the private sector. 
So if someone starts a charter school, the public sector says, well, you have to teach mathematics and you have to teach English and you have to teach social studies and uh, you have to admit your students by lot and we will give you the money, the same money that we will pay for a um, public school. But you can decide whether you do your teaching disproportionately with uh, computers, with uh, people who have this type of degree or that type of degree, um, whether you extend your class days, um, whether you extend your school year, so on and so forth. And by uh, allowing this discretion, you frequently get very great productivity. Sometimes you write papers and, you know, they get cited and um, it may be that the, uh, you know, time from the uh, publication of an idea till it appears in some public policy might be a decade or more. Um, but I have a number of students who call me up and sort of say, uh, Professor Zeckhauser, I hope you, um, they call me up for two reasons. Uh, one reason is they say, I hope you remember me. Um, I'm now um, under consideration to be the Secretary of the Environment for the state of Michigan. I hope I can use you as a reference. And then I try and, you know, remember who the student is. Fortunately, I have every student in my class write an enrichment exercise. And I keep track of these. So if I go back and look at the enrichment exercise that they might have written a dozen years ago, um, I can remember them better, and I certainly can have something to say to, you know, the person uh, who calls me about the individual. So they, they just wrote a really interesting essay on, you know, what we should do about taxi cab regulation in uh, Massachusetts, in Boston. And that, of course, uh, relates to uh, the environment because you get more taxi cabs on the street, you have fewer cars, and that shows the type of creativity we, you would like to have for your um, – uh, Secretary of Environmental Affairs. And the other reason they call me is they say, um, I'm working on this problem for this group of people. Can I send you our white paper or can I talk to you on the phone or can my associate call you on the phone? And that's always, um, you know, very exciting to have someone call you up and, you know, ask you what to do. And occasionally you, you know, some of our students do get into positions of significant responsibility and you know, you can see a little bit of your ideas, you know, creeping into their, uh, what they decide to do. The major executive education teaching I do is actually uh, a program that I chair. It's called uh, Behavioral Finance. And we run that program <clears throat> every fall. <coughs> we have between 80 and 100 students. And we talk about the fact that even in the field of finance where people's objectives are pretty straightforward. Most people want to maximize the size of their portfolio or the performance of their, their endowment, whatever it might be. Um, people make systematic mistakes. So we gather faculty um, from you know, universities all over. I don't just use Kennedy School faculty members. And people come here for a couple of days and we talk about behavioral finance. And of course, um, it was an unfortunate experience, but uh, the financial meltdown um, really gave a shot in the arm to behavioral finance because many people were quite skeptical of it. Um, but when um, the world loses many trillions of dollars of value in a very short period of time, uh, it's kind of hard to <clears throat> argue, as some finance scholars do, that you know financial markets are perfectly rational and all the participants in them are perfectly rational. So that's been a you know a quite exciting. Uh, venture for me. And every year we get some, uh, most of our faculty are just ordinary faculty members, though they're usually involved in the world of finance. But every year we get some um, distinguished outside speakers. Our dinner speaker for this fall, or our, our principal outside speaker for this fall, is a man named uh, David Rubenstein, who's a significant donor to the Kennedy School. Um, he runs an organization called the Carlyle Group. Uh, an immensely successful private sector organization. Uh, but when you hear him talk, he always talks about um, the training he got from some people who were faculty members here. Um, and uh, he also talks about uh, his experience working um, in government and how that influenced his, th his uh, thinking, uh, even about, you know, problems over the course of his lifetime. So, I, you know, I will find it very exciting to 
you know, have him talking to my classroom. I think Bridge is an absolutely great game. If um, anybody listening to this interview gets one thing out of it, it's go off and learn how to play Bridge. Um, Warren Buffett uh, says that Bridge is the best preparation for business. And I would say Bridge is the best preparation for being an economist, the uh, best preparation for being um, a lawyer, the best preparation for almost any other profession with which I have um, any experience because there are two critical things that you have to do in Bridge. One is you have to work effectively with your partner. And over the course of a Bridge session, you'll have um, many successes, but you'll have even more failures. And your failures will usually come about through um, partners not working effectively together. And you have to work on your partnership and make it better. And you have to be able to absorb this blow of getting a bad outcome and move on to the next hand and be effective. And I think that that's true in life, working with partners. I collaborate on um, large amounts. Virtually all of my research is collaborative. <clears throat> and I've worked with many different people who have many different uh, you know, approaches to life. Some of them are brilliant mathematicians who don't understand the real world. Some of them understand the real world very well and think the stuff that I do with mathematics is nonsense. And um, you have to sort of say, here's the best aspects of them. Here's something that I'm going to have to uh, sort of more or less work around. So that's one element of bridge. The other element of bridge is that over the course of a session, you have to make literally hundreds of different decisions, almost all of them under uncertainty, you know, you know working on, uh, you know, gauging probabilities that are not objective. And I think that that's what leads people to be effective in life, to be an effective decision maker. And just as the, um, you know, terrific tennis players have hit, you know, uh, 100,000 tennis strokes, terrific decision makers will benefit if they've made, you know, 100,000 decisions. And if you've played bridge for a while, you've made very large um, numbers of uh, decisions. It also turns out that bridge just attracts um, a very interesting group of people drawn from all lives, uh, all uh, walks of life. I mean, Warren Buffett is one example. Uh, he plays uh, five times a week online, and it's just his uh, you know, real uh, passion. And there are many other people who do the same thing. Evidently, uh, during World War II, Dwight Eisenhower was a uh, you know, very significant bridge player. So I've uh, met many interesting people through my bridge career. Of course, many of them, uh, they're just as bright as my Harvard colleagues, uh, are just you know, full-time bridge players. Um, they aren't quite as disciplined. Uh, so they just apply their uh, brains in a different way. I would guess that 75% um, of my papers <laughs> have uncertainty in them in some context. Um, let me give you the most recent paper that I've been working on, which is a paper um, I'm writing with a young man here, one of our doctoral students named Jeff Friedman. And the theme of the paper is that our national intelligence uh, capabilities, our national intelligence reports, um, uh, treat uncertainty very poorly. Every, within a bureaucracy, there's always tremendous pressure to uh, describe outcomes with some degree of assurance. So things that are just scraps of evidence tend to get discarded. But if you put many scraps of evidence together, you frequently can reach a fairly strong conclusion. So we've just written uh, a paper, and we have a couple of proposals into foundations. Um, to basically look at the whole national intelligence apparatus, what the um, you know CIA and the equivalent organizations do, um, to see how they could deal with uncertainty more effectively, and let me also describe, if I can, uh, three concepts of uh, dealing with uncertainty. Uh, one of which um, I created, which is the first is risk, which is the idea is that there, the outcome is not known but the probabilities of the outcomes are well known. So if you roll a die, each one of the sides is likely to come up with probability one-sixth. And then there are situations where the possible outcomes are known, but the probabilities aren't known. So um, 
you can uh, know whether you know uh, which of the five uh, teams will win in you know the Eastern uh, Conference of the American League. So we know what the possible outcomes are, but we don't know the probability that Toronto or the Yankees or the Red Sox manage to win. And then there's the a third category, which I call ignorance, which is you don't even know what the states of the world are. And I think that unfortunately that ignorance is very important for a range of public policy problems. For example, if you talk about global warming, um, we all know what the um, consequences that people talk about the most are. But my guess is that if global warming is going to prove to be a disaster and we're not going to fend it off, um, the uh, gravest consequence or the second gravest consequence may be something that people are hardly talking about um, these days. Um, I look at the problems that confront the world um, you know, today like um, terrorism and global warming and massive deficits. I would say that those would have to be, you know, three of the top five in the world. And none of them were on the policy agenda 25 years ago. None of them were anywhere close to the top of the policy agenda. So um, I think that ignorance is a real uh, problem. And I think that when you, um, one of the responses to this is that when you're assigning a probability distribution to what could be outcomes, you should just have much broader distributions. You should be much less confident about what you think is going to happen than most people are. So it gets into behavioral decision, gets into the ways to thinking about uncertainty. And if you think about it and you think about it and you think about it, as I do, um, you know, as I walk to work, I tend to think about un uncertainty. You know, who will I be encountering on my walk today? What is that thing that I can't uh, recognize that's lying in the gutter? Um, you know, uh, what are the uh, possible outcomes from, you know, a particular decision that I'm going to make? Um, I think uh, practice makes less imperfect. It doesn't make perfect. You can't even come close to perfection, but maybe you can do a little bit better. One of the challenges that we uh, face is how to get this new world that we're confronting into our curriculum. <laughs> curricula don't change very quickly. Most people use the same course notes that they had last year and the year before. They use the same textbook that they had before. They teach the same things. But the world moves on. So how are we going to stay fresh? How are we going to incorporate these new, pl new disciplines like behavioral decision into our curriculum? I think a very major problem, I mean, I'm a little parochial in this since um, I wrote the book about it, is that I think that collaborative governance is really um, going to be the future uh, for this nation and many other nations. Um, we're extending the book this summer. We thought, what country is as dissimilar from the United States in terms of its government structure <coughs> as any among countries that are relatively developed? <coughs> and we identified China, so we're going to try and write the same book um, uh, using uh, a significant number of Chinese examples or incorporate Chinese examples into our book. So I think that we, this will f require fundamentally new training for our students, much more work on how to understand balance sheets, how to establish incentives, how to you know, contract with private sector organizations, how to analyze what's going on, how to use information technology to monitor you know, a partner's behavior, so on and so forth. So I think that that's a, you know, a major intellectual uh, challenge uh, for us to do this. Um, I would also like to see the school do what Dick Neustadt did <coughs> at the very beginning of the school, which is he reached out to the university and he got, um, you know, my guess is that of the five people he would have most liked to have gotten associated with the school, he got three of them associated with the school in a major way. And I think that we should be doing that now, and we should be looking for uh, giants of the equivalent of Neustadt and Schelling and Rafa and Mosteller um, also to come from the outside to come to our schools. Very hard to recruit faculty members this, these days, but I think that we have to have our uh, antennae up. We now have 40% foreign students. 
my class is probably, uh, since it has a very strong uh, quantitative component, not that you need it, but you have to be willing to think that way. I mean, we don't do a lot of um, equation solving. Um, so I get probably 50 or 55 percent foreign students. Um, we have, um, you know, some uh, terrific uh, faculty members here. Um, I think that we're doing a um, reasonable job of interacting with the rest of the university. So I think that that's, you know, one area where we're, uh, we've done well. Uh, we've done an excellent job of getting our name known around the world. I mean, I'm amazed when I'm in, uh, you know, foreign locales. Everybody seems to know and respect the uh, Kennedy School. I think that may come from more what people like uh, you do than from what people like I do. I mean, we get, you know, get on television and uh, the like. You know, we have forums that come from um, our school. So I think that we've done lots of things. I think the forum itself is a great success. It's a community resource uh, where people come here and you can come here three or four nights a week and hear a wonderful discussion on, you know, what's the future of Europe? How should we deal with the Greek debt crisis? Um, are we really making progress against cancer? Um, you know, are stem cells the future? I, you know, almost any topic you want to hear about, uh, you'll be able to hear about at the Kennedy School over the course of um, a semester um, with large numbers of uh, you know, quite exciting and interesting uh, people. Um, I think that our doctoral students, um, many of whom have been ultimately ended up in our faculty, <laughs> have been a, uh, you know, tremendous, you know, source of ideas. And I think if we're going to develop some of these new fields, we're going to need, you know, outstanding uh, doctoral students. So I think that we've, you know, done quite well there. Um, I think that our campus works, you know, pretty well. We're you know, pretty self-contained, and we interact with each other. And something that we've done that's really terrific, which many schools have not done, is <clears throat> I think that almost everybody here, almost all the um, faculty, likes the other members of the faculty. And we're a very interdisciplinary faculty, and you could easily see the economists not liking the political scientists and the um, people who are experts on international affairs, looking down on the people who do poverty work. And I don't think that we've had that, um, nor do we have too many people. We've managed to keep most people involved in the schools. When we have a um, senior faculty meeting, um, you know, most of our people attend. It's not um, what has happened in um, many large universities where senior people sort of say, look, I'm going to go out and I'm going to cultivate my own garden and not worry about the common enterprise. I think there is a feeling <coughs> of, uh, you know, common enterprise here. So, uh, and people focus on the problems of the school, which I think is very good. So uh, from that standpoint, um, I'm, uh, you know, pretty reassured. We also have right now, um, I'm very enthusiastic. We have a... Uh, extremely uh, bright dean. We have a great executive dean who's a graduate of our school. And uh, we just appointed um, a terrific new academic dean um, who I'm proud to say I've managed, been privileged to co-author uh, many papers with. So um, I regret that I will lose her to a substantial extent as a co-author, but I can you know, certainly be proud that um, at least I knew her when. So I think that we're in good shape vis-a-vis -vis our leadership. And as I mentioned, um, I think that the people who are at the heads of our mid-career program and at, of our master in public policy program are both people um, who I've collaborated with intellectually and who I think are um, you know, terrific individuals. So uh, you know, I think it's uh, the glass is... Uh, 93% full.